Thank you, thank you. I am truly so excited to be here at Big Omaha. I've been talking to Jeff and Dusty about it for a while and finally was able to make it out this year. But it's incredible to see the movement that this community has pulled together in this part of the world. It's just truly inspiring. It's amazing to me what's happening in tech everywhere. Before we kick off here, though, get my slides going. Other side. There we go. Thank you. All right. So before we get going here, I just want a quick show of hands. How many of you have had Blue Bottle Coffee? Awesome. How many of you would like to have Blue Bottle Coffee right now? <laughs> All right. Said DJ Trey Johnson, you tweeted me, man. There you go, brother. <laughs> I'm going to give you the bag. How's that? Here we go. Boom. All right. We'll talk more about Blue Bottle. How many of you have a WordPress blog? Awesome. Thank you. In fact, Mac Mullenweg said, you know, go to Big Omaha. It's got a great vibe. You're going to like that one. How many of you have a MakerBot? More likely, how many of you wish you had a MakerBot? <laughs> Fantastic. We'll talk a little bit about this. And how many of you have the new Fitbit Flex? How many of you would like to have the Fitbit Flex? <laughs> All right, don't worry. There's not a goodie bag in the back, I promise you. <laughs> and then how many of you have an about.me page? Damn. It's awesome. It's impressive. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know me, I wear two hats. I'm both a founder, founder of about.me, along with Ryan Freitas and Tim Young. And I'm also one of the founding members of the True Ventures team, where we get to invest in visionary founders and awesome, awesome ideas. But I want to tell you a bit of a personal story before we kick off here. I think I have to avoid that part of the stage. <laughs> I was recently on one of those flights. I think you guys all know these flights, the, the never-ending one, that we as founders and entrepreneurs find ourselves on far too frequently. And I was kind of burnt out. It's kind of just bored, didn't know what to kind of do. So I picked up my iPad, luckily I had it with me, and I decided to watch Lincoln. The film many of you know, focuses on the few weeks before Lincoln's second inauguration, when he felt just instinctively that this was that moment in time that he could pursue his vision around passing the 13th Amendment to end slavery. And there's one scene in particular in this movie that really resonated with me. It's a scene in the White House kitchen where Thaddeus Stevens and Lincoln are talking. And you see, they agree, they agree on the vision, the big idea, the destination of where they want to go. But what's really crystal clear is that they do not share core beliefs on how to get there. And Stevens is ranting, he talks about the importance and inner or the impurity of an inner moral compass to direct the soul to justice. Those are heavy words. And Lincoln kind of looks at him, he's like, dude, you know, he like incredulously looks at him. And he says, a compass will point you to true north from where you are standing. But it's got no advice about the swamps, deserts, and chasms you'll encounter along the way. If, in pursuit of your destination, you plunge ahead heedless of obstacles and achieve nothing more than to sink in a swamp, what's the use of knowing true north? This notion of true north, I think we as founders, we all somewhat understand that. The importance of vision, the big idea, the power of teamwork. It's knowing what we believe. It's the importance of having a moral compass, both as a person, but also as a founder. I think we all more or less do understand that. But the thing I believe that he's saying here that is so kind of brilliant and kind of duh simple is that 
if you don't think through the journey and think through the steps, and if you don't have shared core beliefs to empower you to get through those swamps, those deserts, the minor, the major confusions, the obstacles, the difficulties, the disappointment, all that stuff that we as founders face in pursuing our vision, our big idea, and in maintaining our own moral, excuse me, maintaining our own morality. Essentially, if we don't have core beliefs, or we don't have an idea of how we're going to get to true north, I guarantee you that we're not going to get there. So at about.me and both true, we have a lot of core beliefs. And in fact, one of our biggest core beliefs when we started the firm was that we genuinely believed that we could make the world a better place for founders. Founders like Katerina Fake, founder of Flickr and now Findery. Founders and entrepreneurs like you. And the reason we wanted to do that is because I think we genuinely, we were all founders ourselves when we came together to make the firm, but I think we all genuinely believe that you're our most important national treasure. You're the most powerful force in our global economy. You're the brilliant minds, the innovators, the people that see the vision, who are helping to shape our world, where we want to go, how we want it to be. It's amazing. And along this journey of working with some of our industries, I think most influential and interesting founders, what we learned is that they're not actually starting companies. The best of them are actually starting movements. Yes, movements. And what makes a movement significant is that it's visionary. It's a vision of how the world ought to be or how it can be. Remember when we all carried, or all, all carried maps? I mean, it's just not so long ago, right? It's a vision of where it can go. And it's having that sense in your mind and knowing how your product and your service and what you're doing and how it impacts people's lives, right? It's that is what makes it visionary. And in that vision is where a movement can be sparked. I'm going to share a couple examples with you. So this is Bree Pettis. We talked about the MakerBot. Bree is the founder. Um, we seed funded Breed in the summer of 2010. For those of you who haven't met Bree, he's amazing. In fact, everybody I'm going to talk about up here is, I, honestly, I'm inspired by. I'm, I pinch myself when I get to talk to them. Bree truly had a vision around the power of 3D printing. Kind of a crazy idea, but he really believes that everyone in every home, in every office, in every place imaginable will have a 3D printer. So you can print whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, wherever you want. I was just reading an article. And, and by the way, the, the, the first machines, when I met Bree, these were just kits. It's almost kind of like meeting you know, Jobs or Wozniak when they had kits. And so the vision is like, you know, can you pre-assemble those things? Can you bring them together? Can you make a mass market? Will Moore's Law help you to drive the cost down to make it accessible to everyone, right? And I think that's a bet that we all believe can, be, can happen. I was just reading in the journal a couple weeks ago that doctors are now using 3D printers in operating rooms in real time to reproduce replicas of organs so they can figure out in that moment, like, what do we need to do and how can we move towards a better outcome? This is fundamental. This is impacting our lives. That's a big vision. That's a movement. He's not the only person doing this. And when I talk about these guys being the founders of movements, I want to be really clear, it takes multiple founders in any given movement to make it happen. But these people are playing key roles. One of my favorite investments that we've been privileged to make in the last year 
is behind this gentleman, James Freeman. It's a non-tech investment. It's a little different for us. Um, James is the founder of Blue Bottle Coffee, and he's arguably the founder of the movement around artisanal coffees. Some people refer to it as the third wave of coffee. He hates that, so I didn't say that, James. Um, but it's, uh, he's just a remarkable guy. And you ask yourself, so, dude, like, what's, what's so, he's just making coffee drinks. That's the skeptical side of all of us, right? But what I saw and what we saw when we met with James is somebody who had core beliefs around what the experience of coffee, coffee drinking, sourcing, all those things should be. He has core beliefs on how do you source product? Where do you source it from? How do you support farmers in developing parts of the world who may not have been certified to have organic licenses? How do you support them? Or how do you support them by buying their product so they can continue to produce the purest, highest quality coffee beans on the planet that promotes sustainability? When you go to a blue bottle coffee, and I'm sure there are places now here and everywhere in the country, it's not just about getting the drink. These people have a philosophy. James has a philosophy around what type of cup? You know, like, why is it a ceramic cup or a glass? What temperature is the coffee served at? What beans? Is it single origin? Is it a blended mix? He has a philosophy that you should not order an espresso drink and take it out of off-premise. Because he believes that when you drink that espresso drink, it needs to be a certain temperature. You might say it's a little crazy, but what he is focused on is every single detail of that experience that impacts something so simple as coffee, a part of our routine in our daily lives, to give us just a little bit of love, a little bit of joy, a little something special, something magical to start the day. And I think if you take a step back and you think about what's happening on a more macro scale, it's not just coffee or the maker industry, it's happening in all ways of life. We don't just want a meal. We want to know who the, who the chef is. Why did she choose these ingredients? Are they local or are they not? Are they organic or are they not? You know, all kinds of questions that we have now when we buy in. Not every single time. I don't want to get up here and say like every single time you go to a restaurant you're thinking that. But that has become part of our fabric. That has become part of the DNA of what we as people interacting with these experiences are demanding. Right? I don't think anybody in this room just wants to work. I think everybody in this room, especially in this community, wants to make a difference. This is a huge change. So when, when we started, and I'm not going to talk too much about About.me, but I want to share, Jeff asked me to share a few thoughts of why I thought it was important, why am I justifying why am I spending my time on this. When we, you know, when I, one of the lessons I've taken from working with people like Katerina and Bree and James and Matt Mullenweg and so many others is this notion of to think big and to reach and to figure out how you're plugging into something much more important than some kind of widget. I'm not knocking making a widget. The automobile industry, the steam engine before that, the computer, these have all been impacted by nominal changes and evolution. In some ways, they're the lifeblood of our technology industry. But what Ryan and I saw was an opportunity to reframe, what we wanted to do is reframe social media. so that you as an individual could have a greater voice and more control over how you're represented online. When we started About.me a few years back in 2010, all everybody was talking about was social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, all this stuff. 
So all these are my favorite services, by the way. I'm not knocking any of them. I use them all, every day, all the time. I'm glad they're part of my world. But none of these services should be given the role of representing me, in my opinion. Google alg algorithms should not define me. They should not define you. That should not be the starting point for somebody to get to know you, some random set of responses to a query you made around somebody's name. I don't buy that. I don't want that. My tweets don't define me. I say stupid, and in, in homage to Dave McClure, who I think is speaking tomorrow, I say stupid shit all the time on Twitter, right? That's not who I am. It's just in the moment, right? It's a piece of me. You know, my professional experiences, I think if you read who I was in LinkedIn and you never met me, never saw my photo, never shook my hand, never got a fist bump, never had me poke you in the side, right? Never saw my smile. It defines me in a certain way that it's, it's a part of me, it's, but it's not. It's not, who I, it's not how I see myself. And certainly, I don't define myself by who I hang out with and who my social graph is, right? These are all pieces of me. I think the only person who should define you is yourself as a starting point. I think that's a really powerful idea to get back to. What happens is so often in life is we just start, you get involved with things. You guys all know this, right? You get, you get involved in things and just once, you know, it's incremental. It's bending the envelope. You just, you do more, 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 and you're doing that, 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 that. And rarely do we stop and just reflect like, whoa, what just happened? What changed? And so I come back to that concept around reframing social media in order to give you a stronger voice to allow you to represent yourself online the way you want to represent, to take back control of your identity. I think that's a really big idea. And if it's going to be a big idea, and if you really think that you're participating in a movement, which we do, yes, we built about.me thinking that we could actually be one of those services that sparked a movement around this notion of identity. You need to be able to appeal to a large sector of people. You need to get to scale. It needs to be nimble, it needs to be flexible, it needs to be easy. It's, it's gotta be really easy to understand the value proposition. It's gotta be beautiful, it's gotta be impactful, it's gotta be meaningful. Those are all things you gotta really think about. This grandmother, and I'm not knocking, I'm, I'm not saying grandmothers don't know how to do tech. I'm sure some of your grandmothers um, are programmers, uber coders, <laughs> I'm sure of it. But what I'm saying is that your product, if you're really going to spark a movement, you got to think about how do you fit into this mass universe of users, of people. So you're not only appealing to this uber coder, drummer at night, mission hipster, whatever he is, <laughs> Cool guy, I, I don't know who he is. I, I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I'm gonna get a note. Dude, you gotta take my face off the slide. Um, but you gotta be able to, to work with all kinds of different people. You gotta work with college students, you gotta work with the retirees, and you gotta be able to address the people that are the core early adopters, the people that are the most enthusiastic, the people that are most active, and to help you to spread the word. That's a tall order really challenge all of you to think about how your products and services and things you're involved with do that. And it's not just founders that we get amped up about. We believe in the power of products that capture your imagination. That's a big statement, just think about that. Products that capture your imagination. This is Chris Anderson. Chris Anderson is the former editor-in-chief and CEO of Wired Magazine. He's kind of a cool dude. Chris had this idea around his kitchen table with his kids on one weekend to hack some Legos and to make them fly. Don't we all do that? 
And what he figured out in the process was that because of mobile applications and all the stuff that's happening in hardware is that the component tree was actually quite inexpensive and it was possible to actually reconstruct or create a commercial drone. Something that's accessible to all of us or to small businesses or farmers or whatnot. We talk, you know, we talk a lot about Drones have been in, you know, the drones are coming, the drones are coming, skies are going to be black. You know, it's all BS. The drones are not coming. Everybody calm down. But we talk a lot about it in media, and we talk about the negative side of it, about its impact in defense and the morality of warfare. We talk about it in terms of privacy concerns, and these are all legitimate, real topics that need a lot of debate and a lot of thought and a lot of navigation. But it doesn't mean that the technology doesn't have amazing applications for real-world experiences. And this is why it captures my imagination, is how does it help the farmer in his, his industrial, you know, applications? How does it help a farmer in surveying to launch out in the morning, to walk out literally with his bird and have it survey his land, to help him with crop management, livestock management, I get this. I grew up in a small community in Indiana. Like, that's real. That's touching, that's touching somebody you wouldn't think drones, farmers, right? How does it help just us who like sports? Like Antonio, man, to have like a better sporting experience. You know, drones above the field, following in, all that stuff and impacts. How does it impact the motion picture industry? How does it impact real estate? How does it impact privacy, or excuse me, security? How does it impact our families, right? All this kind of stuff, these kind of products that capture our imagination, this is what they're going to do. And it's not just companies. You know, the companies I've shown you are companies I have the privilege and we at True Ventures have the privilege to be involved with and to partner with. But it's people like Ben, who I haven't met, who I'm, if you're out there, I'm excited to meet you actually. Or Gentry, who you're going to speak, who's going to speak, I think, tomorrow or Megan, who's going to speak right after me. This is happening all over the place. When we started True, John Callahan, I think, my partner John, was the person who came up with the name. And I remember thinking, wow, that's a bit audacious. <laughs> True Ventures. And he said, no, dude, it's about aligning a bicycle. That's what truing, truing a bicycle is, is creating alignment. And so what we wanted to do when we founded our firm was we wanted to solve the financing needs for entrepreneurs in ways that made sense. We were all entrepreneurs, and so we wanted to just say there's a lot of BS in this system. Let's get rid of that. Let's just do it our way, right? Let's rethink the term sheet. Let's get rid of blocking rights in the early stages when we have $500,000 of our $200 million fund, or now of our $700 million that we manage, and we're going to ask you for blocking rights? That's bullshit. All right? Does that mean that blocking rights aren't going to become part of our relationship at some point in time? Yeah, they are. When we have more money in, we have more skin in the game, and we have more alignment. Sure, that's a reasonable thing to ask for, right? It's getting rid of the legal cost associated with starting these companies. Why? It, like, the stuff is off the shelf. Like, dude, you know, you could... You've got the same legal stuff I've got. Let's just combine and let's spend $10,000 versus $30,000 and let's do this together. Let's just start with alignment. Let's be honest about our ownership, right? I can tell you if I own 10, 12% of your business, I don't have ownership. I don't, I don't have alignment with you. I want to own 20%. That's my business model. I want to be really clear about that. I want to get that right away. Then we're, then we're in alignment. It's being honest. It's being direct. There's so many things that can be done better in this, in this market. And it's a belief that you don't need to raise a lot of capital. Just because it's cheaper to start a company than ever, that is not a good reason, right, to go out and, and well, that's not a good reason for us to say, hey, you need less money. The, the money that you raise in these startups, you don't need a lot of money to figure out if you have product market fit. Our goal is to help an entrepreneur 
to focus and to get to the set of answers that they need for themselves as quickly as possible. It's about opportunity cost, people, right? You guys could all do so many different things. There's a gazillion ideas that we can go, all go tackle. It's about where you're going to apply your time. And I think, and we think as a firm, that when you have too much money too early, that is the swamp. Right? That's the obstacle. That's the thing that doesn't make sense. Then you're married to something that you don't even know you want to be married to. And it's real. Look at these cats. This is Otis and Elizabeth Chandler. They started Goodreads. They had the vision that they were going to create the social hub for people interested in reading. And they started Goodreads with $750,000 and figured out product market fit. I think Otis ended up raising a total of maybe $2 million, maybe a little less. Goodreads was bought by Amazon about three or four weeks ago for a nine-figure number. That's certainly validation. But what's more important is that on that money, he was able to get to 20 million, 20 million people that are on that platform and sharing book recommendations. That's phenomenal. This is Stenson Beach, and in 2005, as we were starting the firm, we met, I had actually known Matt, but, but the rest of my partners and us, we met with Matt Mullenweg, founder of WordPress. <laughs> I'm sure he would love this photo. If you've seen Matt lately, he looks like Jesus. He's got hair down to here. He's like, you know, he should be, when he's up on stage, he should just be backlit with his arms like spread. <laughs> He's in Africa. I hope he's not watching. Um, but Matt Mullenweg, this is a, you know, I think he's 20 or 19 or whatever. He's just a kid. You know, he raised a half million bucks to start WordPress. He had the audacious dream that he could take a piece of open source blogging code and create a platform that would serve as a voice for all communities and societies around the world. Right? And he wasn't the only one doing this. I know Anil's here, who was part of TypePad and Movable Type, and there was Blogger from Evan and whatever. It's, once again, it's a group of people, right? A group of founders that are a founder of this movement. It's just amazing what he's done. You know, today, WordPress is arguably the CMS of the web. Over 18% of all websites in the world are running on WordPress. That's phenomenal. I think the next... 18%, what's that mean? I think the next company is less than 2%. That's huge. That's a, that's, that's a big company. And he started a movement. We believe in capital efficiency. And when we started the firm, we honestly had no idea how powerful this was going to be, right? We thought it would apply to technology and little things and whatnot. But we had no idea that capital efficiency was going to allow us to crash the barriers of so many industries in such a widespread way. You know, this manufacturing is now replaced with this. It's not a bad thing, it's a great thing. It's enabling entrepreneurs and founders like you to pursue some of the biggest ideas to create some of the most important movements in some of the largest planets on the earth. That's what capital efficiency is, right? It's amazing what's happening. It's impacting healthcare, it's impacting manufacturing, it's impacting the classroom. These industries weren't available to any of us guys, you know, 10 years ago, they really weren't. They're all available to everyone in this room now. When we started True, and I always find this amazing, because I think of True as like an incredibly young firm, and it is an incredibly young firm. You know, in 2005, this did not exist. Think about that. This did not exist. Sure, I mean, I was an investor in one of the first smartphones. Andy Rubin had a company called Danger, so it existed somewhat, but it didn't exist in kind of a widespread way. Think about the disruption that this creates 
Think about the collaboration that it creates. And what this means for you is I think that you have access to capital in realistic ways because you don't need to raise $5 million. Maybe it's half a million dollars. Maybe it's a quarter million dollars to kick off your dream. You have access to talent. You have access to curiosity. And you have a community of seasoned entrepreneurs now that didn't exist before. People that are like-minded, people that know how to share core beliefs or get on the same page and figure out a journey towards solving some of these incredible opportunities. So I think if you're, if you're interested in being part of a startup or being a founder, wow, like, don't be fooled. Forget about all the macro stuff that happens in economy. In 2008, as a great example of this, 2008, do you remember when that all that stuff happened? It was scary, right? Scary for all of us. We made a decision. We had a core belief that we did not believe that that was what was real. Despite everyone in our industry saying so. Sequoia wrote an RIP post. I don't want to write, Sequoia is a great firm, so I'm not knocking them, but it is ironic that they wrote that post in that time frame for people that are so smart. That, we made more investments in the fall of 2008 than we've ever made as a firm in any one quarter. It's amazing, right? So now is a great time to be an entrepreneur. Now is a great time to be a founder. So that brings us back to Lincoln. Excuse me. I think you and me as founders and entrepreneurs, and what I'm trying to say is I understand, I get it. Like, it's a lot of stress in starting a company. It's how do you get funded? How do you stay funded? Which, how do you hire people? How do you convince people that, like, this is important, right? That this is something that they should spend time on? You know, should you use AWS or should you buy your own hardware? You know, it's how do you get the word out? These are all real problems. No detail is too small for any of us. But I think the opportunity is for you to stop and take a look and just think and ask yourself, how does this product that I'm envisioning impact the world? How does this product capture people's imagination? And how can this product spark a movement? Because if you do that, I think it will guide all of your secondary decisions. And I think that is your path to true north. Thank you.